What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town University. You are here with us, your jolly hosts, once again, Matt and Zach. Matt, yes, we're jolly today because it is four days until Christmas. How are we doing on this lovely Thursday, December 21st evening, my good buddy? Feeling jolly? <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling very jolly. I had a nice little company Christmas party. We did a little white elephant, and I got myself uh, a new uh, Amazon Echo for one of my coworkers, so I really appreciate that. Shout out, John. I know you are hopefully watching. I know you're not a hockey fan, but I did tell you to watch, so I hope you're out there. <laughs> I feel pretty good. Really excited for the Christmas season. It feels like it's, uh, I mean, it actually is right around the corner. It doesn't feel like it, because it actually is, so... Yeah, I'm I'm very excited for Christmas. It's it's um it's a very fun time of year. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it couldn't be any more fun without hockey. Yes, and that's why we're here. We are a hockey related podcast. But Matt, I do have one question for you before we start moving off. Because it is Christmas time, and yes, it does not really feel like Christmas. I wonder if that's because of the weather, global warming, whatever the issue is. But because it is Christmas time, tell me what is your favorite Christmas movie? But also, give me your favorite hockey scene, and that can be Christmas-related or not, just to include that in there. So, let's hear it. Man, I mean, it's a lot to choose from. There's so many good ones out there. Classics, a lot of classics. Yeah, that is a really tough question. I mean, it's kind of a, a tear between two of them, and it's really, it's really hard to pick one because I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the other. But I really absolutely love the, not the animated Grinch, from a while ago, but like the one with Jim Carrey, the live action one, that yeah. one is so damn funny. He is so yeah. good in that movie. Yeah. I absolutely love that movie. And you know what else is really good? I, I really like Christmas Vacation with okay. Chevy Chase, Beverly D'Angelo. Yeah. I know that's maybe, maybe it's a little bit outdated. I know it was in the 80s, but I, I think it's an absolute classic. I'd watch it literally like probably five times every single Christmas season. I, I absolutely love that movie. So it's it's very tough to choose between the two of them. It might have to be a, a first place tie for both of those. And nice. I mean, I guess I'll just take the whole movie of Miracle. Like that that movie is absolutely amazing. I That's know pretty like much pretty much everything in that movie is you know, hockey, obviously. So I'm gonna have to take that one. That that's an absolute classic. Yeah, that's pretty much a Christmas movie in itself, right? Like I that's suppose so. That's an American Christmas movie. It's a, in my opinion, if Die Hard can be a movie, so can Miracle. Okay, so that's right. Good, good choices overall, buddy. Honestly, The Grinch with Jim Carrey, the live action back when we were growing up in the early two thousands. I think that came out in the early two thousands, maybe yeah, ninety nine, oh one, oh two, something like that. Yeah, classic. Though. I remember watching I mean, it as a kid. Um, so this one might hit you home too. Um, what I'm about to say. So my favorite Christmas movie of all time is going to be Elf. Um, with Will oh, Ferrell, yeah. obviously you can't. Same thing with Jim Carrey, just a classic movie that's just super funny and never gets old. And my favorite hockey scene, and it actually comes from Elf, and you might not have known this, and I think a lot of people don't know this, but there's actually a deleted scene from Elf where Will Ferrell is playing hockey with the other elves, and he's destroying them all on the ice, which is hilarious. If you have not seen it, let's go look it up on YouTube. Very funny. But if I actually had to pick a full entire movie, you can never go wrong with Goon. I love Goon. Funny yes. freaking movie. The second one's not as good, but if you have not watched Goon, I highly recommend for any hockey fan to go watch that movie. It is very funny, and it seems like a player that some of the Red Wings could currently use on their roster now that Clint Clawson is out. And so with that, Matt, I think that is a good segue into moving forward on this episode. And so we are changing things up on this episode a little bit, but before I announce how we're doing it, we want to thank you all for stopping by. Once again, if you are returning, if you are new, we definitely appreciate you for stopping by. But nonetheless, if you are new, make sure you do hit that subscribe button. If you are returning, but you haven't done so already, make sure you're doing that as well. And you are hitting the thumbs up button. Turns the frown upside down. Right, Matt? Yes. No octopus today, once again. We nope. need to get the whole crew one, I think. So we need to find out where Derek got his from. But Yes. And if you are listening to us on Spotify, make sure you are giving us a follow and you are rating us five stars. That really does all go a long way. And so, Matt, like I said, we are changing things up a bit. Um, We typically go around the league news, Red Wings news, main topics, game notes. We're going to go in reverse order today, kind of see if you, the fans, like it a little bit better. And so 
without further ado, let's just go ahead and get right into it. So talking about the game notes, let's go over the last two games, which would be against the Anaheim Ducks, which was on Monday, and then against the Winnipeg Jets, which was on Wednesday. And so let's go ahead and jump into the Ducks game where the Red Wings did lose 4-1 to one against the Anaheim Ducks, which was at home at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, where Larkin finally came back. Whew. Thank God. Thank goodness. And I'm just going to put this out there. We don't have to go in depth about it. I'm not sure how many of y'all saw that video that Lego Rocks 99 put out there that had the huge Larkin scare that this person knew about the Verona situation and supposedly knew about the Larkin situation that Larkin might not be able to return and it's a lot worse than we thought. They were wrong. Thank goodness. We're thankful for that. So don't put out stuff that might not be true and don't always listen to people on the internet. Anyone can say anything they want, including us. And we do. Our opinions are our own. Thank you. And so, without that, yeah, Huso was in that. Lion was not practicing. Wings going into the game. Let two in before the 10-minute mark. I'm just going to go really quickly through this game because this game really hurt. Huso ends up getting injured after letting in those two in the first period. That's not good. Lion just got injured the game before. Huso had to come in and replace him. Huso gets injured this game. Now Reimer comes in to replace him. And we just had an episode talking about how much a John Gibson could mean to this team. Now it seems like it could be really useful to this team. So continuing on, the Ducks score on the power play to make it 3-0 to to end the first. Not even two minutes into the second, the Ducks make it 4-0. Overall, just pathetic effort by the team in general. They did not even look like that they even wanted to be playing hockey out there, let alone look like that they even arrived to show up on the ice. Petrie was able to get one back right after to make it 4-1 to one and almost scored on another, or to score another on a wraparound attempt. Luckily, Alex DeBrink had decided to put the team on his back and to put up two goals in the third to make it a 4-2-3. Unfortunately, the team was not able to come back, and that was the final of the game. And I said four to one. I don't know why I said four to one earlier. It was four to three. Overall, Red Wings played a really bad first period. Like they weren't interested in playing hockey at all. And that first period was the worst they've ever played this entire that, season. And saying I, that, I couldn't even believe it. Yeah. And saying that that's been the case for a lot of these games lately, but yeah, other than that, Matt's and I'll let you continue on the injury to Huso is a huge blow. This team couldn't seem to get enough. Shooting options, the Ducks were just clogging up all the lanes. No one was getting in front of the goalie to apply pressure on the net. No one was going towards the net. A lot of parameter shooting, a lot of high slot, high point shooting, like they've been doing a lot of these games. And then just another very frustrating loss for this team. And with this loss, I think that put them at 1-5-1. Do you have anything that you want to speak about on this game? Not so much about this game as much as just like our injury situation as a whole. And I do want to point out um, that, you know, the break had got two goals. That was, that was pretty massive. Yeah. He was definitely very cold before that performance and the him yeah. very two goals was honestly, that's, that's great for, you know, his, his confidence, number one, and just like his, his performance in general. So we can definitely feel good that we've got him going now. Um, I, I guess he is kind of a streaky player. Like that, and that's maybe just what he is, but you know, 28 points in 32 games. Like he's one of our better players. Like you can't deny like the numbers are there, but uh, yeah, good to see him get going. Um, I think the fact that we have one goalie who is seems to be out long-term in Huso and lion, I guess maybe we'll see him hopefully sometime in early January. We, we can't ride with Reimer Hutchinson as a tandem. We just cannot do this. I mean, there's a lot of rumors about trades. Like, of of course, we should mention we're in a roster freeze right now. We're not going to be able to trade or do anything right now until after the Christmas break. Why that's a thing, I don't really know, but it is. So whatever. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of trade rumors around some goalies in the league. You know, Elvis Merzlikens got scratched the other day. A lot of trade rumors around him. Karel Vamelka down in Arizona. It seems like Connor Ingram is kind of making that his net. The Red Wings need to be in on these talks. 
especially with two goalies injured right now. Like, yeah. James Reimer, if everything was ideal, he'd never see the ice again, or maybe he'd play once every 10 games. Like, we did not want this guy to ever start again after the Ottawa game. Like, we all said, put in Lyon, Husel will back him up, and Reimer can just stay here until we don't have to pay him anymore. That's what we said. Now he's forced to be our number one, and we just can't we can't go on like this. If if he if if we just sit on our hands, and by we I mostly mean Steve Eiserman, and we don't trade for a goalie and fix this right now, because these goalies, to be to put it very bluntly, they're not even good when they're healthy. The fact that they're injured and it's gonna be pretty long term, you need to do something and you need to do it now. Or else this season, I mean it's kind of already off the rails, but it'll it'll fall off a cliff. Like yeah. if I'm being completely honest and I don't want that to happen again. I know you definitely don't want that to happen again. Our listeners, besides the Ottawa Senators fans, which by the way, get the hell out of here. They don't want that to happen again either. So we got to do something. We have to do something. Yeah. This could be a very, very messy season if we don't. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And just kind of backtracking on some of the things that you mentioned. Um, yeah, Alex DeBrick had getting those two goals that actually helped get him his 400th point career point um, off of a Kane assist off of the first goal that he scored. So that's good for him. Congratulations to him. And Kane keeps on racking up the points. I'm pretty sure now he has, I think it's like four points in the last two games, which is awesome for mm -hmm. him. Um, you during in, in between the Ducks game, and going into the Winnipeg Jets game that happened Wednesday night, which was yesterday for us, in between then you had the Red Wings recall Austin Zarnick, why not Berggren? Because now you had Clint Costin, who is also out. He got injured during the game against the Ducks because of Radko Gudas, pretty sure, and I forgot to mention that, Radko Gudas hit him so hard, pretty sure Costin broke a couple of ribs. That was gnarly. But, yeah, called up Zarnick. Not Berggren, which is still very confusing. We'll we'll talk about that. The Red Wings then have to put Huso and Kostin on IR because they're both week to week. Huso probably longer. I'm guessing that he's out for a month to a month and a half. I think he's out that long. And then Lyon is out until Christmas. And just like how Matt mentioned, yeah, the there's a roster freeze for the NHL where that began on the 19th at midnight. And then that goes until the 28th at midnight, so 12.01 on the 28th. So Red Wings technically can't do anything, and thank God that the Red Wings didn't play on the 19th or the 18th when this happened or whatever day it was, and Steve Eisenman was able to make some of these moves because then you had to sign Michael Hutchinson, who literally a couple of days prior signed with the Grand Rapids Griffins. I mean, when things happen, things happen quickly, and things surely did happen quickly for Michael Hutchinson. Um, he signed a one-year, two-way deal contract for the remainder of the season. Th yeah, with Reimer as now your starting goalie, we we were kind of hoping that we'd never have him play in that again, and unfortunately now he's all we got. The Red Wings play tomorrow on Friday, and then they play Saturday for back-to-back -back games, and then we don't see them play again until next Wednesday. So we're at least going to see Michael Hutchinson get one game, right? I'm assuming out of this. Probably. Unfortunately, right? But it can't be as bad as Reimer. No offense to Reimer. And we'll let's just go ahead and talk about the Jets game. I thought he looked pretty good in the Jets game, to be completely honest with you. The team in general lacked. So Reimer and that Jets now on 21 straight games, but 20 straight games going into this game of not allowing more than three goals against. The Red Wings always win when they score four plus goals. I don't think they've lost where they've scored more than four plus goals. So Wings had a strong first period in my mind, but the Jets get one first by a Neil Pong shot that hits Petrie in the glove to deflect into the net. A little soft one by Reimer, unfortunately, but not much you can really do about it. It was just... A really unfortunate deflection. Olimata gets the wings on the board with a ripper to tie it 1-1 to -one early in the second period. Kane making another pretty pass to get that shot and goal off. So there's another po Kane point for you to all the naysayers that think that Kane is a reason why this team is losing. You're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Uh, 
Nikolai Ehlers gets a wide open net front goal to make it two to one. Jets. Johnson Falby makes it three to one. And it's four to one Jets. I didn't even put down who scored because I was just so mad about this game. I mean, the Red Wings just I have it right here. This team lacks the ability to get the puck out of their own zone and get bit, beat repeatedly. Three Red Wings straight up the middle and no one covering anyone, any single person. And it was Waldman's person. Someone put that in here. I think I put this all in here and then someone must have changed it up a little bit for me. Maybe I didn't. Anyways, the Wings have no discipline in the offensive zone either, making the goalie's job really easy the last few games. Like I mentioned, no one's getting in front of the net. No one's driving towards the net. I'm seeing Alex DeBrickhead shooting high slots, and we're seeing a lot of parameter shooting and a lot of high point shooting. I believe I saw you make a tweet about that yesterday, Matt, uh, during the game, or you might have texted it to us. It's just incredible. Kane does make it 4-2. to two. That gives them four points in two games, like I mentioned. Jets make it then 5-2 to two with four minutes left. Again, no one covering the back door. Four wings down low. Wallman finishes minus three, and Petrie finishes minus two. Not to single anyone out, but this defense has been very bad since the loss against the San Jose Sharks, which so happens to be Patrick Kane's very first game as a Detroit Red Wing. And no, Matt, and you would agree with me, and you can go and tear into some people that these losses are not a product of Patrick Kane. I don't care what anyone says. Patrick Kane might be a defensive black hole, but he is not a defensive black hole to a whole entire team. People are going to sit there and say he has a locker room cancer. We have had our captain out, our number one cap center, our 2C, our middle six winger, who also wears an A on this team, Costum was out, and now you have both of your two top goalies out. This couldn't have been a more worse time for Kane to join the team. And so, Matt, why don't you – what did you think about the game and, and, and go in depth about why Kane is not an issue for this Red Wings team? Well, I generally don't think that the people who are seeing Patrick Kane as a problem on this team are actually watching the games or – really even hockey in general, because he's literally been the best forward on this entire team. Like, you watch this guy on the power play, like, we haven't seen passes like this since Dotsik was playing. Like, I'm not even actually, like, exaggerating. Like, he is such a good passer, and he's got a great shot, too. I Like, he is really, honestly, on any given night, the only one who is consistently trying to generate offense. Because you watch all these guys, whether it's Gostaspare, Sider, Wallman, whoever the hell it is, take 40,000 point shots the entire game. And I don't know what they're thinking. Like, well, maybe we'll get a deflection in front of the net. And maybe one of these will go in. Maybe someone will screen on this team. The only problem is nobody screens on this team. No one stands in front of the net. We don't have a Joe Pavelski sitting in front of the net t- tipping passes in. So I don't know why that strategy is still a thing that people think it's going to work. It doesn't work and it won't work. So I don't really understand that. And honestly, like, you watch these games, like, last night, I think they had, like, 35 shots on goal or something like that. You watch that whole game, you would have thought they had 10. Because yeah. none of these shots are high danger whatsoever. They are all right. point shots, or just point blank shots, right into the goalie's chest pad. They're going to stop that 1,000 times out of 1,000. Like, none of those shots are going to go in. They just, they don't generate any offensive pressure. You see them enter the zone. They immediately get closed off by someone on the boards, and the other team gets the puck. It's like 10 seconds of zone time. Then they go to their own zone, and it feels like the team is there for five minutes, just getting chance after chance after chance because we cannot get consistent defensive pressure. We can't force turnovers. We can't force errors. In fact, we have a lot of unforced errors too. It's not even the other team's defense most of the time. It's just us doing stupid things, just no look passes, just shots like panic shots are really panic shots is what they are. They say, well, we don't have anyone open in here because no one can get open. Let's just throw something in the net and see what happens. That's pretty much our whole offensive playbook right now. So, yeah, it's it's not great. And I mean, we can we can dog on Reimer all we want. Like, I will not ever argue against the fact that Reimer has been very bad this year. I don't think anyone will. Red Wings fans, it's pretty clear that he's not popular here. This team defense does not make it easy on him. There are so many breakaways that are being put out, so many two-on-ones. The defensive lapses are just, it's too much. And something needs to change. Whether it's personnel, 
whether it's just coaching scheme. I really don't know what it is. Like you bring up Edvinson, Edvinson is not going to be the one size fits all, you know, the, the universal solver on this problem. He's not going to come up and all your defensive problems are going to be solved. In fact, they're probably going to stay as bad as they are right now. And it's really not going to help him develop because if he's playing on this team, the way they're playing team defense right now, I genuinely think his development would go backwards. That's how bad it is. So I don't really know what to tell you. I Something needs to change over this Christmas break, whether it's personnel, whether it's coaching. I really don't know, but it can't continue like this. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. And that's, you know, that's a good segue into, you know, one of our main topics, which obviously is in our title of our episode. But let's let's go into. Yeah, let's just talk about, like I said, I, I really thought that continuing on with the game, I, I thought Reimer played a really good game. I really did think that structurally this team in the defensive zone gets lost all the time when they're in the offensive zone like you said there are just no high danger shots created whatsoever i mean and i was texting someone during the game and i was like okay rasmussen going to the front of the net and trying to poke one in right at the start of the game i was like this is exactly what the red wings need to start doing a little bit more is getting more in front of the net and taking those opportunities. I'm also seeing a lot of deferred passing where a lot of players aren't taking the, taking the option to shoot. They're doing a lot more passing. I'm seeing a lot of these behind the back passes. That's really not working. I'm seeing them where, you know, they catch one near the blue line in the off offensive zone. And, you know, from someone trying to wrap it around and they're trying to, to push it back on the half wall and, and they're doing it very lightly and, and and it just goes to the opposing player and it's just very confusing. So schematically, the system five on five wise just really does not seem to be working very well for this team. And that seems to be where they're struggling the most. Personally, I mean, and we can talk about the power play and the penalty kill. I mean, in the power play, I believe we're ranked 14th. And then you look at the penalty kill. We're ranked, I think that's 23rd in the league for our penalty kill. We have a 78.4% penalty kill. The highest in the league is 87.5 to your favorite fraud team, the Boston Bruins, Matt. So, I... Well, they're frauds. And that, that really does take us back going into our main topic, which we're not going into quite yet. So, Matt, let's... Go ahead and change the subject up, and let's go ahead and talk about the Red Wings news, where we have quite a bit about it. And so, a little more on the happier side, let's talk about the World Junior Championships, where we've kind of already talked about some of these players, and we really don't need to go into too much more depth about them. But I'm just going to call out their names, say congratulations to them, and kind of spit out their numbers of what they're currently doing with their prospective teams. Nate Danielson, we already said, makes Team Canada. Nate Danielson currently has played in 20. I'm assuming this is updated. If it hasn't, I do apologize. But it looks like in 24 games played still for the Brandon Wheat Kings, he has 11 goals, 14 assists, and 25 points. And then you have the two Swedes, Axel, Sandin, Palika, and Anton Johansson making Team Sweden, like I just mentioned. And so Axel, Sandin, Palika in 25 games has 9 goals, 4 assists, and 13 points. And then Anton Johansson, where are you at? There you are. This season in the Swedish Hockey League in 25 games, he has three goals, three assists for six points. Anton Johansson is a right-handed shooting defenseman, for those of you who do not know. And honestly, putting up some pretty good numbers for the SHL. I'm very impressed with him. I believe he was a 2022 draft drafted player by the Red Wings, and he's been doing nothing but improving and becoming a name that I'm noticing more and more as time goes on. So congratulations to him over the team. USA is our boy, Trey Augustine playing over at the Michigan state university in the NCAA and in 17 games, he has a 2.97 goals against average and a nine sixteen save percentage. Like I said, I hope these are right. I feel like I'm spinning off the same numbers. 
that I have in the last few episodes. So my apologies, my internet also sucks. But then you got Kevin Bicker, who we did not get to mention at all, who is going over for Team Germany. He has been playing with, and I'm so sorry for pronouncing this team name wrong, in the DEL with Lowen Frankfurt, where in 24 games he has one goal, no assists for one point total. But the caveat to Kevin Bicker, and I know some of you are probably going to sit there, well, Mullard Sider, he put up more points than that when he played in the DEL, right? Well, he did, yes. However, apples to oranges, right? And so for Kevin Bicker, in four international junior games that he has played this season, he does have eight points amongst his peers for four goals and four assists. So good for him. Keep it up. Don't let the naysayers get to you. Keep learning your defensive game over there in the DEL and continue providing the offense in these international games. And hopefully we'll see you in North America here shortly. And so, Matt, got anything quick to say on these players? Uh, I'm mostly just really excited to watch World Juniors. It's always a lot of fun to watch. And it's just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think it's just like a fun little... I mean, it's not like a little tournament. It actually means a lot to the players that are on it, you know, like especially the European players. Like, I don't know if you know this, but like these like international competitions over in Europe are like insane. Like they're literally like the Stanley Cup finals. That's how serious they take them over there. So, yeah, yeah it'll be really fun to watch what our young guys can do. Um, I really do expect Sandine Palika to just absolutely light the world on fire. Um, as far as Nate Danielson, I know he's on a very stacked team and it's kind of down the depth chart, which I do understand that, but I do expect him to, you know, chip chip in a lot offensively. And you no, know, Augustine, he'll probably be the most interesting to watch. To be honest, I I think he's hopefully going to be as good as he was last year for Team USA. I, I I think he will. I mean, he's really had a great season over in Michigan State, and uh, I actually learned this recently today. Michigan State is, I think, like the fifth best team in the country in college hockey. I had no idea how good they were. That's actually insane. And yeah, he's definitely a big part of that. So yeah, it'll, it'll be very interesting to watch him play. I, I'm expecting great things out of him, not only in this tournament, but you know, in the future as well. So yeah, real juniors is fun. It's a lot of fun to watch. It's, you know, like a little holiday tradition. So I for sure will be watching a lot of games. Yeah. A lot of stiff competition out there. I mean, we, we announced the team USA roster we said some really high highly touted names i mean you got a lot of recent draft picks from the 2023 draft and so it's going to be a very interesting project or prospect tournament to watch and so i'm very excited about it you know it always comes around this time of year right after christmas time and so yeah and it gives us the opportunity to see some names that will be upcoming in the 2024 draft and so you get to see names like macklin celebrini and cole eiserman out there hopefully and so yeah, stay tuned. Watch some of that. It's great. Get to see some of these names that you'll be hearing for a long time, probably in the next five to ten years or so. Be on the lookout for that. So, Matt, another Red Wings news. Because of the Red Wings' two losses, they're now fifth in the Atlantic. Three spots from a wild card now. So that's some sad news. Let's talk about Dill Larkin. Larkin says he truly believes the NHL has the best refs in the world. But it's the message being sent down from the top, what is safe and what's not, and how to discipline it. There's a lot of questions there, and it's kind of scary as a player. I'm not sure if you got to listen to Dylan Larkin speak on the whole entire thing. That's just one clip from it. Um, but after hearing that, or I guess the whole entire interview that he had, what do you think about this? What does this say? Do you think a lot of other players feel the same way? Or I guess what's your takeaway from this message from Dylan Larkin when he spoke on this matter after getting knocked out on the ice? Yeah, well, I really only agree with one part of the statement. Uh, <laughs> I shall definitely does not have the best referees on the planet. I think we've, uh, we don't really need to bring up the whole thrown stick incident again, but uh, right. it pretty much sums it up right there. So yeah. don't really agree with that, but you know, Dylan Larkin's a company guy, so whatever. Um, yeah, but yeah, as far as player safety, uh, I, I really f wish that more people other than just Larkin in this league would speak up on this because he's not the only victim of the department of player safety, just completely butchering their jobs. I mean, it's, 
there's countless players in the NHL every single year that get shafted by them. So yeah, it, it, it really needs to, it needs to be addressed more among players and maybe that's how you enact change through that. I, I really honestly don't know at this point, but hopefully you get enough players to speak up for some change to actually happen because it, it's just ridiculous what's happening. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate him kind of stepping up and you know it makes sense right like the guy got knocked out on the ice and if you're not completely confident with the ability of the department of player safety which they are there to make sure the players are safe if you're not confident in them you kind of need to do something about it and speak up and i'm glad he did yeah no i'm right there with you i kind of wish a lot more players in the league would step in and say something but obviously like you said larkin is a company guy and so he was very respectful in the words that he used and so i don't blame him for being as light as he could on the matter and so i'm sure he probably would have used a different quite a few different words um in that statement but yeah he he's not wrong right where it, it is a scary situation where you don't know what's going on and that no one really seems to have a protocol and the type of runaround that they, that the league gives their players, it, it, it's very unfortunate. It's just not good business in my mind. And so I think the NHL is very lucky that these players really love what they do. If they didn't, then they probably wouldn't be standing up for this type of mediocrity that they provide for the people who bring in the money, which is the players, right? Not just the fans, it's the players. The players bring in the money. We We, we give the money to watch the players, not... Gary Bettman being horrible at his job. And so, yeah. Well, that's it on the Red Wings news. We kind of covered some of the other stuff like Hutchinson, Zarnick, Who's Ho, Lion. So, Matt, let's go into the main topics. And you already know what we're going to talk about. So, Matt, is Coach Malone on the hot seat? It's only year two, but is he on the hot seat? No, I'm going to push back on that. I don't think he himself is on the hot seat, but I think the other coaches on his coaching staff, namely Alex Tangay, um, his ski is scorching right now. I think the others, they're definitely starting to feel the warmth a little bit. Um, you know, we have Bob Bootner, who's an assistant coach. He's supposed to be in charge of the defense. And this team defense, to just put it plainly, has been flat out awful. It's been absolutely awful. Top to bottom, forward defense, everybody. Everybody's been bad. Even Sider's been bad. And Wallman. They were fantastic last year. They were like the two guys that we could rely on. And they were like the go-to guys that will always put up a responsible defensive game. They, I mean, they've done it this year. They just don't do it as consistently as consistently as they usually do, especially in out over this losing streak, which is part of the problem and part of the reason that we're losing so much. Yeah. I think the assistant coaches should be feeling the warmth a little bit. Tangay. I mean, I don't even really know what to say about Tangay at this point. They start the power play in the in the other team's zone. Like, it's actually insane. They start the power play, and the puck is being shot to their goalie. Like, it, I don't understand it. I, the, the power play is terrible. Flat out terrible. You brought up Patrick Kane, who's a power play specialist. A lot of us theorize that he would pretty much only be on the power play because he's a power play specialist. Plus, you got Debrinkit, who can absolutely rip it. All you got to do is find him open, and he'll bury it. And the power play still sucks. So I don't really know what to say anymore. I, I don't know what Eiserman sees in Tangay for some reason. I mean, we were calling for him last year to be fired. He's still here. So I don't really understand what he sees in Tangay, to be completely honest. But he's got to move on from him this offseason. Maybe even earlier in the season. I, I really don't understand how much worse this power play has. Does it have to be the worst in the league before something has changed? It feels like it has to be the worst in the league before something has changed. That's legitimately how it feels because it's been terrible. Yeah, I don't. And maybe maybe you can answer this, Matt. Has there ever been a case where an assistant coach was fired midway through the season without like a scandal going on? Like they were just right out fired because they're no, it, their it, penalty it, cables? No, it doesn't happen very often. Usually the, co the head coach gets fired and the assistants go with him because they're hired by the head coach. And this is not me saying that I think Lalone should be fired. I, I honestly don't. I mean, I'm definitely right. not happy with him right now with a lot of his personnel decisions, you know, calling up Zarnik instead of Berggren. I, I really don't like these personnel decisions, putting 
thing lines together that just don't mesh and clearly don't mesh. And I, it feels a little blasho, to be honest, which is sacrilegious to say, but it does feel that way. I, I can't not mention that. Um, but I still think Lalone needs a little more time to make it work. Uh, he's he's a player coach, you know, assistant coach from a Stanley Cup dynasty. Maybe you don't want to call him a dynasty, the only one too, but, you know, they are really good for a long time. So, you know, I, I think he's the guy, you know, he's going to get the most out of his players. Um, I, you've seen it with Larkin, with Debrinkit, like they, they're all playing really, really well. Even yeah. like the depth players are playing pretty well under him. So I I really don't think it's time yet to start that dialogue, but I'm I'm really starting to doubt the coaches he brought in because it's yeah. the, this team as talented as they've become. You know, they added a lot in the offseason. They added a lot of talented players, plus Petrie, you know. I mean, like, it really should not be this bad still, and it is. So it's it's time to start pointing the finger somewhere else. Yeah, I – yeah. We – and this happens with any team as a fan, right? There's always going to be that scapegoat player. And, and I know that I, I picked on Waltman and I picked on Jeff Petrie a little bit earlier based on their plus-minus, and we know that plus-minus really doesn't mean all that much. I know. Trust me. Don't, don't hurt me. I'm not – saying that oh they're minus three so they're the worst player on the team no but it's been consistent that way right and where we keep on noticing a trend here with wallman petrie um even with some of the forward players shane ghost bear really hasn't looked truly up to speed you even called out mo cider earlier lucas raymond hasn't been scoring where's joe valeno been robbie fabry's kind of falling off a little bit you even said Alex DeBrincat finally, too. I mean, Alex DeBrincat, yeah, I don't know what's up with him. He's he's finally getting some more points on there. He looks pretty good in, in yesterday's game against the Jets, too, so I'll give him that as well. Um, Yeah, I, I'm not sitting here saying that I think Lalone is on the hot seat. I really don't. I don't think that Lalone is anywhere near close to losing his job or that he should be fired by any means, but we definitely should start questioning the coaching staff as a whole. And I, I tweeted this out, I think it was yesterday or it was today. Uh, someone on Octopus Thrower said, made, made a tweet about something, so I quoted it, and I said, no, we should start questioning the coaching staff as a whole. And so you brought up Bob Boobner, or Boner, uh, Alex Tange, then you got Jay Ver Verity, or Ver Verati, however you want to pronounce it, you know? And Alex Tange, yeah, I, I've been saying this for quite some time, I mean, he mainly takes care of the power play. That's 14th in the league. Okay, you're right over average in the middle. You're right over, and I'm pretty sure that's where we were last year. At the yeah, beginning of the okay. season. Do you, want, do you want to know why we're ranked 14th right now? Because we came in the first 10 games of the season that had the hottest, hottest power play in the league. Yes. How's it been for the last 20 games? Exactly. Dog shit. Excuse my exactly. language. Dog shit. So. No, it, and that's what I was trying to get at, too. And had you have not started off hot, we would be in the same probably 100%. in the same spot that our power our penalty kill is which is ranked 20th i think i said 22nd earlier it's actually 20th um and that's also garbage too and i'm pretty sure our penalty kill was actually pretty decent last year if i remember properly and so it's not just our defense it's how we play defense as a whole entire team and just like you said when we're on the power play it looks like the other team it still has five players out on the ice like it's five on five like i our team just cannot stay in the offensive zone to save their life. And then when we're even five on five or on a power or in the penalty kill, we can't even get the puck out of our zone to save our lives. It's insane. It, do you, do you want to know what my biggest play. issue is with this power play? It, it's the number one thing that I just don't understand why they don't adjust. Nobody on the power play, whether it's the first or second unit ever rotates their spots. They all stay in their assigned yes. spot. I watched Washington last night beat my Islanders. Yes, I cried a little bit. No, I didn't really, but, you know, still got a point. Um, so I, I watched them play, and there was a moment where they decided, look, we have no scoring opportunities right now. All of our players are covered. They passed the puck to, I, I don't know, I think it was the defenseman or something like that. Guess what they did, Zach? They rotated their players, and then they got cool. open. They got a chance. Passed it to a guy who was wide open. He shot it and scored. They don't rotate on the power play. Like someone will get crushed into the boards and get smothered. Nobody moves. 
The only I, time I don't they understand it. They stand there like statues. The only players that I really ever end up seeing moving are the two, the two defensemen or the two players near the blue line. So the two top players, the one quarterback and the other one, and then you got the one who's like basically on the half wall, which is usually Kane or DeBurn Castle. So you got one of those two players too. So like the two top ones and the one on the half wall, those three are usually the ones who are rotating or those top or those four sometimes. But it's not always like you're saying. And they're only slightly rotating. And it's usually the two defensemen, whoever it is, playing on the top the top power play at this current moment. But you I don't can't. need your defenseman to rotate if you have a solid power play quarterback. You don't so, need that to happen. And you see it all the time. Any team you're playing against, the penalty killers, all they have to do is pick their man, stick to their assignment, and eventually a pass will be sent your way. And all you have to do is break it up. And you have a chance the other way. It happens every single time on the power play eventually too i think you have you have to you have to split up kane and debrinka at that or you have to start putting kane and debrinka and this is kind of going outside of the power play i think you have to start putting kane and debrinka on the top line with dylan larkin yes you have to make you have to make your top line the most lethal line as you can absolutely we're we're only seeing production out of Kane and Debrinkat on the power play as it is currently. Those two goals that Debrinkat scored came off of the power play. We need to figure it out five on five, and we aren't able to currently. And that ultimately comes down to the coaching. And it's not just alone; it's it's a it's a system thing at this point where it's on Boner, Tange, and Verity Verardi, however you want to pronounce it. Once again. It's on these coaches to figure it out. I've been on the Alex Tange train for a while that he needs to be sent to somewhere else. He needs to go to Hogwarts. Narnia. It, it's and you. You said this, and and I was going to bring it up too. Is that we started out so hot? We even did that last season, Matt. That happened mm-hmm. to us last season too, and I'm pretty sure even the season before that. And so I don't know what it is where these players they everything starts to click right away. And then they just fall to really bad habits. It's almost, it gives me Jeff Blashville, Blash Hill vibes to a certain degree. And yeah, don't even get me started with this line jugglings. I mean, you have Alex DeBrinkett and Patrick Kane. And I get it. You know, when the roster comes out, the starting lineups, they, they take them with a grain of salt because they're still going to get more playing time. They're going to play like they're on the second line. But they have them listed with Andrew Kopp on the third line. Come on, man. That's, you're getting... Uh, Alex DeBrinkhead and a Patrick Kane to play with an Andrew Cop, who I guess okay, sense. yeah, he can he can play defense for you, and that's one thing that we're lacking in. A lot of people, not just me, have noticed Andrew Cop not doing his whole entire role out there, and he is one player that you can nitpick a little bit too. But you can nitpick with the whole entire team. The whole team needs to play defense, and that overall is the biggest issue. And last year, Matt. We were saying how this team, we were afraid that they were going to be like Carolina or the Islanders. Now look at the Red Wings and the Islanders where we're two high-scoring teams. But right. we can play defense. The Islanders at least look like they could play defense. But they also have Sorokin, so that might help. But No, it's not even that. I mean, I can tell you as an Islanders fan, like Sorokin has not been great this year. And like they're winning games based on their ability to limit the chances for the other team and then generate offense off that, which... If that sounds familiar to you, that's because that's the entire system that Lalone does here. The only difference is it works in New York. It doesn't work here. And I don't really know why it doesn't work here. Some of it is definitely personnel, but you've got enough two-way forwards on this team. And, I mean, Sider and Wallman, are they the best defensemen in the entire league? No, but they are very good defensemen. Like, we've seen them put up elite defensive play. We've seen it happen. So this is why we dog on these guys as much as we do, because we know they can be better and they have not been better. They've been way below average, which is, as I've said before, a big part of why we're losing right now is our top guys are not playing like top guys. So you can't rely on your, on your depth players because they're depth players for a reason. They do their role sometimes, but they don't contribute offense. You can't rely on those guys. Yeah. Yeah, and going back to the coaching, and, and this is something I was going to bring up in around the league news, but we just had a recent coach coaching fire, and that was in DJ Smith with the Ottawa Senators, and now they have, and I have this listed down here. Let me let me say the names properly. You have 
Jax Mar- Martin, who's the interim head coach, and then you have Daniel Effortson, who joins the team, team's coaching staff as Red an assistant. Legend. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying, like I said, and I'm reiterating, I don't think Coach Lone is going to get fired or should be fired. If I'm putting it on a scale of 1 to 25, 25 to 50, going like that, 50 to 75, where am I at on the hot seat with the loan? I'm at a 25. If we don't make the playoffs, my seat is still 25% hot with him. Going into next season, it's staying at 25% hot because this team, you expect them year over year to get better. If it does, if I don't see any improvement going into next year around this time, that's when I would start to worry a little bit more. You at home, if you're worried right now, you shouldn't be. Expectations shouldn't be as high as they currently are. We were at a high moment, yes, where the team was super on fire. But Matt, I mean, after the the Sens, I mean, does this clearly shows that this division means no joke and and we have competition i mean i know that we we sometimes like to ride on the suns a little bit and and you know buffalo's not doing too hot and montreal's not really doing too hot but it's us it's these four teams now in the Atlantic division where it's us montreal buffalo then the suns we're really not that far ahead of them and so if they start to pass us does that when we have to start getting a little more concerned where my 25% hot seat has to start getting into the 50%? I I mean, we have to start asking these types of questions. And so what, what does that kind of mean for the Sens? Do you think the Sens are going to now pick it up a little bit more? Or, you know, is, is this something that we should really start thinking about is, is a co- coaching change, even though we are two seasons in? And I know you already said no, but at least should we start looking at a new assistant coaching system with this Red Wings team going into the off season. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know that this is a results driven league. I think if you finish this season and you're noticeably behind where you were last season, there's going to be a lot of red flags drawn up yeah. about not just the coaching staff, but I mean, Lalonde included like that, that's what it's going to be really bad. I mean, the jury's still out in my mind. If we just miss a wild card spot by two or three points, I'll, it's a loser talk, but I consider that a win, to be honest. I mean, that's that better than you did it last year. But, yeah, if you're, like, seventh in the Atlantic again and you're, whatever, 12, 14 points outside of a wild card, that's not good. That's yeah. really not good, especially considering the fact that Eisenman did everything that he could in the offseason, bringing in Comfer, who's been really good, bring, um, trading for Debrinkit, signing Debrink. Patrick Kane. Like, he... Ghost signing Gosters Bear. Yeah. I mean, signing defensive help. Like, he has done everything he possibly can. He signed two goalies in the offseason. He's done everything he can to improve this team. And if they finish behind where they were last year, boy, it's it's not going to be pretty. It really is not going to be pretty. Yeah. And so, yeah. No, you're exactly right. It's, it, it's, it's, it's results driven. And so that, that led to the Suns firing DJ Smith because – I mean, you you go on social media, you go on Twitter, you see these Suns fans were ripping, r- I mean, absolutely ripping DJ well, Smith apart. I also mean, insane, so. Yeah, I mean, v- based on polls, yeah, we're not going to talk about those polls. I Maybe we'll talk about them right. on the next episode. I mean, I, I do remember how we just ripped into Blasio in the, in the last year of his career, so I don't want to say too much, but yeah, no, it's not pretty for DJ Smith. Yeah, so and now um, they're now they're talking about hiring the Marley's coach, which I mean, yeah, that worked great for you to hire one of Toronto's coaches. Why don't you why don't you try that again? See how that works. Yeah, we'll oh man. All right. Well, um yeah, continuing on with the main topic, I mean Matt, at this point, why, just why haven't we called up Jonathan Burgers and why haven't we called up Simon Evanson at this point? I mean, we're talking about Forwards really not showing up defensively. We can score, but we really haven't been scoring as of late. But I think if we played more defense, it'll, it'll show up on the ice. And and one thing that we that we brought up was the fact that we can't clear out of our zone. And one thing that Simon Evanson has been praised on is the fact that he can get the puck out of his zone and the transition game is there. And so Bergers has been tearing it up in the AHL too. I mean, he just got sent back down, and I'm pretty sure he's got two goals in the last two games since he's been down there. And so... Matt, what what what's going on? Why can't we just have these two guys come up? I know I said my argument was you still have to have good players down there, but now I'm kind of on the on the train where 
they're just outshining like or they're they're over out what how do i want to say this outshining the ahl right now they are doing so phenomenal that they really should just be in the nhl right now so i'm at that point now what what do they have to do now at this point is it really just now about injuries yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's about injuries, but it's like I mentioned earlier with Evanson, like the way that this team is playing defense as a whole, you bring him up and you you put him in this system, I, I really genuinely think you'd be harming his development. Like, we are playing defense so poorly right now that bringing him up would not be the thing that fixes everything. I promise you, we're not one Evanson away from fixing this defense. I mean, who... Let's be honest, like, he's playing phenomenally. I do want him to come up because I think... He deserves to be in the in the NHL, but he's not coming up and playing like Mo Sider did his rookie year. I generally don't think he's doing that. He may be able to hold his own, but don't expect the guy to be the best defenseman on this team night in and night out. Like that's way too high of an expectation for him. So, and yeah, as far as Berggren, I, I generally just don't know at this point. This is my one huge issue with Lalonde and the rest of the coaching staff is they just seem to be in love with Austin Zarnick, who literally does nothing. When he's up here, he literally, what does he do? I generally don't know what he does. Keep that guy in the AHL. He's actually a good AHL player. So that's to your point. Like, does the AHL just need really good players? Yes. They need an Austin Zarnick. We need a Bergman. Like, I don't understand this. So yeah, I don't get it. I mean, yes, you need Grand Rapids to be good for all the rest of those prospects that are down there. They're really not playing well right now, which is honestly just sad to see. And honestly, a bit shocking too. Um, yeah, I, I, I think at this point in, in the stage of the rebuild, I think it's more important to bring up your young players that can shine on this team. Because let's face it, Zach, I mean, we're, we're coming up on eight years of no playoffs if they don't make it this year. I don't I don't want to be the next Buffalo. I, I really don't want that to happen. So, which we probably won't because, I mean, Buffalo is really bad this year. So, I don't know, maybe we won't be. But, yeah, it's it's not good. It's really not good. I don't even remember yeah. what your question was, but it's not great. Why haven't they been called up yet? I mean, you pretty much, I mean, there really is no nail on the head. I mean, at this point, it pretty much just comes down to, just comes down to injuries. I mean, that was the only reason Bergeron got called up and it required th- not even three injuries. It required Larkin to be out. It required Perron to be suspended and it required Costin to be injured. And, uh, JT Comfort to be injured as well for Bergeron just to get a call. Right. So four players, which is I, it blows my mind to be honest. I looking back, you know, it was cool that we were able to. You look back at the signings in the off season, right? Where Eisenman goes and gets a Justin Hall. You signed him for three years. You could justify that, okay? Kind of at the time, right? A lot of people were like, "Well, what the hell? You know, good luck." You're you're gonna pair him with Ben Trot. Before that, you had Olimata extended for for two more years, right? And so that's Cider, Jake Wallman, Sharat. We'll just say Mata, and then you had uh, Hall, and then you could have placed him with Simon Edvinson. Then you got Shane Ghost Bear. Okay. So could Hall be the seventh, or are we just going to roll with six defense and then we just, you know? Then you add in a Jeff Petrie. Okay, well, what the hell are you actually doing now? Because at the time it was like, cool, okay. Like, but like, why would they make it so difficult to ever bring up a Simon Evanson up onto this team? To me, it just does not make any sense. It's kind of the same thing with the forward situation. I mean, yes, you would probably much rather have a Patrick Kane than a Jonathan Berggren on your team, right? You would probably agree with me on that, right? If you were to ask yeah. someone, okay, yeah. But same thing. You add a Patrick Kane, and that's just another player to stop Jonathan Berggren from entering onto this team. And so, maybe Steve and Lalone both just really don't think either of them are quite ready to handle that type of load that they want that or Steve and Lalone really truly think that we need these players to be good enough to where they can be out a top six or a middle six player or or middle pairing or top pairing guy 
which to me sounds ridiculous. I, I really do think that's ridiculous. I think, you know, bringing Edvinson and having him play 18 minutes a night is, is not hurting him. And I also don't think having Bear Grin come up and having him play 13 or 12 minutes is really going to hurt him. If anything that no. benefits your team. And they no. learn yeah. from these other good players. So... No, I I honestly personally disagree with that. I I honestly but, think that's the ideal plan with your prospects is you bring in guys, and if your prospect really is that good enough where they can beat out a middle six forward, that means they belong on the team. So right. once they get on the team, they will produce. I mean, I, I think that's exactly what every GM should plan with their best prospects. I really honestly do. It's not right. like putting up a roadblock for these guys like, what's better like you you have a marco casper or a uh, uh, carter mazer down in grand rapids who you know you you sign i don't know pick any player we'll pick michael rasmussen not to pick on him i'm just picking him like you if, like to pick on him you did this last episode too you just like i don't really him. mean to pick on him yeah he's actually been a lot better so i <laughs> i think i reverse jinxed him so that's actually pretty good for our good team job. in general um yeah so i mean just just pick anyone on the roster pick i don't know Clem costin like if Carter Mazur is down in Grand Rapids and he's lighting it up and you look at both those players and you say to yourself, like if you're alone, you say to yourself, man, this Carter Mazur guy, let's give him a chance. See what he has. That's a great, that's a great thing. Like he deserves to be up there. Now, if you didn't sign enough players and you need Carter Mazur to play on the team with no AHL experience, that's pretty bad because that means you're leaning on the guy and you're really you're going to the guy and you're like, listen, I know you just got done with playing college hockey. You had a cup of coffee in the AHL. We need you to step in on the third line and start sniping. You don't want that. That's bad for Carter Mazur. That's yeah. bad for the Red Wings. That's bad for everybody. You don't want that. So yeah, that, that's what, what in my mind is what's happening. Yeah, no. And I, and I completely understand that, but that's, that's different than what we're talking about with Berggren and Evanson, right? No, it is. That, that's right. Played in the AHL last that is year. Right. Berggren played the season before that, and he no. led the team yeah. in points. He broke the record for the team, and so it's a little different. But I understand what you're saying. Correct. I wouldn't have done that with Mazur or or, or Wallander or any of those other players. But um, no, going back to it, it does sound like that you would agree with me, though. That like, yeah, I mean, if Clint Costin, I mean, Clint Costin, we signed him for a specific reason. We wanted him to be a heavy player out there. And he really hasn't. He's done that a couple times, and that's the other thing with this team. They're just really soft, and that's a yeah. thing that I think coaching has to instill in these players. Is like, hey, like if like something happens, like Moritz Sider was the only one who laid out a hit in yesterday's game, and that right. was at the start of the game, pretty much, and. That was it. No, no, like no scrums. I haven't seen little to no scrums. I've seen, you know, no one backing up players. It's just, it seems like the boys are a little lost and I do, really can't seem to pinpoint what it is other than I think it's coaching. It's got to be at this point and, and, and something in the coaching has to, has to light their butts on fire and, and, and give it to these players. And, you know, I even said something to, the Grindline podcast online and and they tweeted out something. It was relevant to the goalies. And I asked them, you know, who who on this team is going to be the one to step it up or which players are going to be the ones who step it up? And they responded, the team as a defense have to step it up. While I agree with that, however, right. someone on this team still has to make it, has to make that jump to to put the team on their back. It, it looks like it's Patrick Kane and Alex to bring at right now, so far. But it's minimal still. And so that's why I said not just one or two. It has to be multiple. And so I think having a Berggren and an Evanson called up really could add a little bit of youth to this team and energize them in a certain way. And so I think that that only does help them out, especially giving them the was exposure to players like a Patrick Kane and some of these other good players. Right. And so we got to have deeper conversations as times goes on, but Matt based as it's looking to finally close off this, the main topics. Do you think this team is a wild card team come trade deadline? Yes or no. No. Okay. Do you, do you want to say why or no? You just want to leave it at that for now. I mean, listen, 
it's a long season. Yeah, we're in a rough patch right now, but everything that we just mentioned are season-long problems. The power play is a season-long problem. The team defense, season-long problem. The goaltending, I mean, I could keep going. They've been problems all season. And we need new personnel in here or it's not going to work. It's not going to change. I mean, I, everything I said about Evanson, like, if you think for one second I don't want him on – I want – I don't want him on this team over Jeff Petrie. You're insane. If you don't think that I want Bergeron on this team over Austin Zarnick, you're taking crazy pills. Of course I want these guys on here. They're difference makers. We need difference makers on the team. We signed Patrick Kane to be a difference maker. He's been that. But you need more than Kane and Debrink and Larkin every night. You need the entire team to step up and do their job. You need yeah. the Andrew Cops to step it up. You need the Quim Costins to step it up. You need the... Gostas Bears, the, the whole defense. I'm not even going to name names. The whole defense. Everybody needs – Reimer needs to step it up. Michael Hutchinson, if you get in a game or two, do what you got to do. Step it yeah. up. Like, this yeah. team won't win with two players playing out of their mind. That This isn't the NBA. Like, you can't have For Damian the Lillard. The Oilers. What? Yeah, well, no. Yeah. We're not the Oilers. Yeah, exactly. No. You don't have a Leon Dreisaitl and a Connor McDavid on this team. So you can't expect two players to bail you out, out bail you out night in and night out. That doesn't even work for the Oilers. They fell flat on their face at the beginning of the year. It, it, it doesn't work that way in the NHL. The entire team needs to be good. You know why Vegas won the Cup last year? Every single player played as well as they possibly can. Nice Did they out. have the biggest names on that team? Not really. They had Jack Eichel, Mike Stone, John, or Mark Mark Stone, excuse me, Jonathan Marcheseau, William Carlson. Those are good players. I don't think you could say any of those players are top 10, top five in the league. I don't think any of them are, but maybe they all played. Maybe. Okay. Maybe some of them are fringe. Sure. Why not? They're not top five. I, I don't think you can say that. No, but no. You know why they won the cup? Because everybody did their job and they played together as a team and they did it well. That's what you need. You need every single player on your team to do their job to the best of their abilities, night in and night out. And if they don't, you get streaks where you go one, six, and one in your last eight. That's how yeah. this happens. So that's just it. Everybody needs to step it up. There's no secret formula. There's there's no secret Krabby Patty formula to this team. Everybody needs to step it up. That's all that needs to happen. And you will see wins and they will be a playoff team. But until that happens, they're not a wild card team. They're not a playoff team. Quite frankly, a lottery team if they keep playing like this. Yeah, I'm. You know what? I'm. I'm still hopeful. I think. I'll, I think a lot can turn around. I think it really does come down to. Hopefully, Lion comes back around the time that we think he's going to come back, which would be after Christmas, after this holiday freeze. That would be phenomenal. I think if we can get him back, and if he can somewhat hold the fort down until Huso comes back. Like I said, I project it's going to be at least a month, month and a half until he comes back. If it is that long, I think you I think you have to go look outside and, and try to bring in some help. Um whether that's goaltending or it could be defense. I mean what if Waldman really never comes back to the to the pace where we thought that he was going to be at at the beginning of the season. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And so the only way that we're going to get them is by continuing to watch the team play, but yeah, something's got to give here. And it's not just the defense. It's not just the offense. It's not just goaltending. It's the team as a whole. And that includes the coaching. I'm going to say, I do think that they can make a wild card spot looking at it. It's Carolina and the Washington capitals in it. Then you got Tampa Bay and New Jersey devils ahead of us. New Jersey's kind of in the similar situation as we are. Their offense is outstanding. Their defense is all right, on paper, their goaltending is just atrocious. So there mm -hmm. can that's who you're battling for for goaltending. Then you got Tampa Bay. They finally got Vasilevsky back. Their goaltending was horrible in New Hansen. Now they're starting to climb them up. Carolina has horrible goaltending. Matt, I mean, do you really think these four teams I just named off, do you actually think that they are better than Red Wings currently? I think the Red Wings are are maybe not one player away, but I think in a league where anything can happen, I think the Red Wings could still make a wild card spot. 
Yeah, I mean, it's December. Like, sure, they they definitely could. But, like, just based on what I'm seeing right now, I just, like, yeah, obviously the season can turn around. This is exactly where we were at this point last year. Like, the team turned it around in February and March, and they played really well until they ran into the Ottawa Senators. And, you know, it goes back to the toughness you're talking about. The toughness was a problem on the team. Yeah, Toughness pretty much kept them out of the playoffs. Um, Yeah, they, they just... They need to turn it around. I, I think they can. Honest, I'm not writing the season off. I think they can yeah. because they've shown earlier in this season that they can play better than this. That's what's so frustrating about it is I know this team is better. I am no longer watching the 2019 Red Wings. I Danny DeKaiser's not out there anymore. Madison Bowie's not out there anymore. Like These players are better. That's what's so frustrating about it is they have more to give. They're just not giving it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's some, something's got to give and it's the whole team. Give us some wins. We're tired of our battles. We want dubs. Put that in our stockings this Christmas, please, Santa. We'd appreciate it. And so Matt, that's it for the main topics. I think we went blue enough in the face with those. So let's go ahead and kind of close it off with around the league news real quickly. And then we'll go into our final thoughts. Shall we? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Well, what do we got for around the league news? Well, I can tell you what the best NHL franchises of the 21st century are. Once I pull it up in my handy dandy photos here, Matt, if you had to take a guess at what the number one best team or best franchise of the 21st century was, who would you guess it was? Like in the NHL? Yeah, in the NHL. Sorry. Yes. Oh, in the 21st century. There's a lot of teams that come to mind. Yeah, only 23 years so far, so... Yeah. I mean... Jeez. Pens went to four cup finals, won three of them. Maybe I'd have to say the Penguins. Well, yeah, you actually got it right. So in this order it goes the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Tampa Bay Lightning, Vegas Golden Knights, which I'm very shocked that they are up there considering that they... That's recency bias if I ever heard it. <laughs> that is very recency bias. I haven't even been in the league for... What, it's probably been like five or it's six years. It's not even a decade. Now. Yeah, Definitely not 23 anymore. years. Then you got the Blackhawks at four, Red Wings at five, Bruins, Devils, Avalanche, Kings, Capitals. Kind, okay. kind of shocked New Jersey's in there. Are you – maybe it's because of the Hughes brothers? Did they go to – No, a, it's because uh, they had like two cup wins in like the two th- like early 2000s. Yeah, early I know 2000. that's why. Yeah, yeah so that's okay. pretty much why. That makes sense, yes, and it makes sense for the Kings. Avalanche, same thing. And so, yeah, I'm I'm not – I guess the only flag I have is really the Knights at three. I'm really shocked at that. And then I did make a tweet for the Red Wings, and I can't remember, but in that span, the Red Wings went to – had won two Stanley Cups. They went to three Stanley Cup final appearances. Um, I think it was 17 or 16 straight playoff appearances. And then – 908 wins in the last 23 years of this century. And so congratulations, Red Wings. Good job. Could be better on the win column, but we've gone through some oh. tough years. Yeah. Now, so. um, talked about Suns finally firing DJ Smith. Uh, former NHLer slash Red Wings legend Martin Furk has been suspended five games for his high skate to Lawrence. Pillot's neck area. Did you see that video? Yeah, he's a total brookhead. I mean, it's no surprise he's not in the <laughs> NHL anymore. Like, this guy literally just had, like, the hardest shot ever, and that was the only thing that kept him in the NHL for yeah. more than a cup of coffee. Yeah, he was with the LA Reign, their AHL team, for, for quite a period of time. And, and I, like I said, I don't know if you saw the video, but, dude, he looked like a young child out there, like, doing the doggy paddle, just flailing his legs around. Like, it was it was very bad. The, I think the suspension was well worth it. And, it, yeah, it yeah. was just very bad, especially after the one incident where, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to relive those anymore. But, uh, yeah, in other news, okay, the NHL freeze started the 19th, ends on the 28th. Close it off on the league news, Matt. This might make you sad. We brought him up recently. I can't remember when, but former second overall pick by the Flyers, Nolan Patrick retire, retires, retires, retires at the age of 25. He hasn't officially retired from hockey. He did put that out there, not from hockey, but he has retired from the NHL. So it seems. 
in the 222 games that he did play, he did post 32 goals, 45 assists for 77 points in his career. During his career, he did have his seasons with the Philadelphia Flyers and the Golden Knights. Um, He had major concussion issues and he was battling those throughout his four seasons. And yeah, best of luck to him. Hopefully that uh, NHL money can uh, get him a uh, a restaurant chain or something and uh, he can live out the rest of his life happy. Hopefully concussion-free. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like he's not completely done. He could always just go over to Europe, play in Germany or something, Switzerland. Like, it's pretty sick, honestly. Yeah, that'd be cool. You know, be you know who just who who uh, started their 51st or uh, is in – or. How do I want to say this? Yammer Yager is 51 years old and is starting his, his debut this season and his 51st uh, season or whatever. I, there I you go. Anymore, you, but yeah. You could play on Yager's team. I mean, 51 years old and still playing professional hockey. Granted, it is for his own team, but dude, that's pretty impressive. This guy is going to go in the Hockey Hall of Fame in like 2045. He's just not going to stop playing. Nolan Patrick or... <laughs> no, Yarmer Yager. Yeah, no okay. one Patrick's going to go in. I thought so. Okay, Matt, before we go into our final thoughts, so the Red Wings' upcoming games will be against Philadelphia Flyers, speaking of, on Friday, tomorrow, for us, while we're recording for you guys, that will be today. Friday, uh, 7 p.m. in Detroit, at home at Little Caesars Arena. Then they go to New Jersey to play against the Devils, Saturday at 7 p.m., this will be the last recording until probably the 26th or the 27th, and there's no games until the 27th uh, after these two games that I mentioned. And so be on the lookout for us. We will be having a wonderful holiday, spending it with our families. We want you all to do the same amongst yourselves. Maybe I'll get bored. Maybe I'll just create a random episode. Who knows by myself? But boys, take care of yourselves. Girls, you as well. If we have lady listeners. Welcome. We appreciate it. But Matt, final thoughts, buddy. Let's close it out. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Yeah, I hope the last two games of, uh, you know, before Christmas are wins. Well, I hope. I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't really know what to say anymore. I hope they win. It, it feels good to win. Yeah, my final thoughts are. All I want for Christmas is a couple of Red Wings dubs. I want one player hat trick. If I could ask one player to get a hat trick. Oh boy, I'm looking at I'm looking at the players. Michael Rasmussen. I wanted to be David Perron because David Perron is coming back yeah. in the next game. I'm very happy that. that he was able to get all of his money back that he was supposedly to lose. It was going to be 150k. He did get that back. It was the least they could do after making him go through the whole six games. It was a quick six games, but if I could ask for anyone to get a hat trick. It would be David Perron and his game back. Um, yeah, I want a couple of Red Wings dubs. I want you, Matt, to have a wonderful holiday break. Derek, Alex, everyone, to all of our viewers, all of our listeners, however you watch us, however you listen to us, we thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. It's been one hell of a year. We're coming up to our one-year anniversary pretty soon. We couldn't have done this without Shell. It's been a lot of fun, like I said, and so... Matt, those are my final thoughts. Let's go ahead and close it off. Thank you for stopping by. If you are returning, if you are new, we appreciate y'all for stopping by. Make sure you hit that subscribe button as always and hit that thumbs up button and rate us five stars on Spotify if you haven't already. Until then, we'll see y'all on the next one. Ho, ho, ho. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.